Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Shields, and I am a Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today, we will be hearing from one of our district vets, Charlotte Kavanagh, about managing bloat and other animal health issues in Western New South Wales. You should see the following control panel on your screen. If you don't, please click on the orange arrow to display the control panel. Here you can choose your audio option as well as ask any questions. You are in listen only mode, which means you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Today's presentation will be recorded and you'll be sent a link to the recording after the webinar. We will be answering the questions you have sent through in your registration form. Throughout the webinar, if you have more questions, please type them into the questions box and we will answer them. I will now launch one poll question to start today's webinar. This helps us to gauge who is joining us today and to check that all of the webinar program is working correctly. So I'm just launching a poll now. Okay, so you should see on your screen a poll that says, what is your industry role? Are you a sheep producer, a goat producer, a cattle producer, a mixed species producer, or an advisor? If you don't see the poll on your screen, you may have to exit the full screen and then answer the poll question. Very good, I'll just give it a couple more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'll close that poll now. and share the poll results. So you can see in the audience here today, we have 20% sheep producers, 20% cattle producers, 40% mixed species producers, and 20% advisors. I will now hand over to Charlotte. Charlotte has been a district vet based at Burke since 2005. Prior to this, Charlotte worked in mixed practice in Cootamundra. So I'll just change over to you, Charlotte. Just waiting to view Charlotte's screen. There we go, we have your screen, Charlotte. Okay, great. So firstly this afternoon, I'd like to acknowledge the owners past and present of the land on which we stand. Here in Burke, I'm on Namba country, but there are many, many nations represented across Western New South Wales. And on your screen, you'll see a nice aerial view of the Cutterborough Basin up near Yantabula, near Hungerford. So this is us, Western Local Land Services region. As you can see, it's pretty big. We're about 42% of the state and um, we extend right up to the Queensland border, across to the South Australian border and down to the Victorian border. So consequently, we have a really large range of um, production across and, and conditions across this region that we deal with. Um, the majority of our region, sorry about that. Um, the majority of region is um, extensive grazing with property and paddock sizes increasing in the Northwest. So most pastures are unimproved, native pastures. There is some cropping country in the South and East. Um, either irrigated or non-irrigated, obviously, depending on the season. Um, you can see the Darling River system um, and its associated catchment areas running through the middle. The previous photo of the Cutterborough was only taken last week and um, it shows that flood out area in the Cutterborough Basin, which is fed by the Paru and the Warrego. 
and will be topped up by the weekend's rain. So in general, the majority of our producers will be running stock in very large paddocks, some with groundwater and some with water piped to troughs from rivers or bores. Extensive grazing and groundwater create challenges for graziers for the prevention and control of bloat. So what is bloat? So the definition of bloat is ruminal tympani, which pertains to being like a drum um, or simply distension of the rumen with gas. So in that cow on the left, you can see that left side of the abdomen is distended, which is where the rumen sits. And as the disease progresses, they will have distension on both sides of the abdomen. Unfortunately, in our conditions, we often find our cattle um, looking like the one on the right. So it's a sudden death syndrome. So who does it affect? It can affect all different types of species. So dogs get what we call a gastric dilatation and then they can get a volvulus so where their gut actually twists. Humans, us, I'm sure we've all gorged ourselves at Chris, on Christmas dinners. Um, and then of course, ruminants. So cattle, sheep and goats. Um, cattle particularly seem to be affected the most, but it certainly can occur in sheep and goats as well. So the cost to the industry um, of beef cattle and sheep producers, so that, that's um, excluding dairy producers, was estimated in 2006 by Sackett Homes et al um, at about $47 million a year. So that's just not in deaths, but that also includes um, cattle that have the disease in its more chronic or subclinical forms, which basically means the bloat situation goes up and down a little bit. And in these situations, they're not going to be grazing as normal. So there is, um, this infects, affects consumption and consequently growth rates. But also the treatments of prevention, uh, the cost of treatments and prevention. And also, um, and it's a big one for us in our region, is the inability to utilise those highly productive pastures that we've been without for so long. So just getting back to basics, um, ruminants basically are just rumens on legs. So um, as producers, it's very useful to have a basic understanding of how the rumen works, as this is the engine room of our stock. So we can see on this diagram, um, the food comes down the esophagus and the entry point to the rumen is called the cardia. Then it goes through the, into the rumen, the largest compartment of the um, four, the four compartments of the ruminant stomach and then into the reticulum which is the one that when you open it up the lining looks like honeycomb then into the amazing which is the really solid um, oval shaped compartment that when you open it up it looks like leaves so that's pertaining back to the bible reference to the bible and then into the fourth stomach which is called the abomasum which is basically a true stomach so it's similar to what humans will have and carnivorous animals will have and then out um, the small intestine. Just got another photo of a cow, or picture of a cow here. It's a bit of a dodgy pic, sorry, but you'll get the gist there. So you can see that the rumen occupies um, a large part of that left side of the abdomen. You can just see the layers in the rumen. So you'll have your fluid fraction down the bottom, the fibre mat of food halfway up there. And then generally you'll have that gas cap. And you can see how it sits right up against the diaphragm. So the rumen is normally about the size of a garbage bag. So when we talk about the requirements of um, cattle, we talk about them needing to eat like a garbage bag full of food a day. And with sheep, we look at um, the size of a normal shopping bag. So when this is enlarged with gas, it pushes on that diaphragm and places pressure on the lungs and the circulation. So there are two types of ruminant bloat, primary and secondary. So primary bloat is also known as frothy bloat, pasture and clover bloat, wet bloat, and the other form um, other than pasture is the feedlot bloat, which is also a primary bloat. Secondary bloat is referred to as gaseous bloat or free gas bloat or dry bloat. Um, in Ethiopia, the term for bloat is bukuksa, which I thought was a bit cool. And there are some other historical terms, including hoven, hoove, timpani, and blow that you may have heard of. 
So primary or froth frothy bloat, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, it'll generally affect more than one animal in the flock or the herd, and it's caused by the consumption of a highly digestible diet. So this passes through um, the process of digestion quite quickly and in the process becomes quite slimy and traps little gas pockets within the rumen content forming a foam. So the analogy that I would use here is um, a beaten egg white. So basically there's a picture of the egg white there. So when you're whipping up the egg white, you're introducing air into that and the particles of the egg white help to trap that air in there and you end up with those nice stiff peaks which form that stable foam. Secondary or gaseous bloat may only affect individual animals. So it's generally a physical issue which prevents the gas from escaping, 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 sorry. Um, so pretty much um, we would be familiar with the old choke, that type of thing. So vegetables and fruit um, that may be used in drought feeding or what you hear of it overseas that gets actually stuck in the esophagus. Um, things like plastic bags can be a problem. So um, when I was doing some reading about this, I was reading about bloat in on export ships. So cattle being the inquisitive and obviously getting a bit bored on those, those ships chew anything they can get a hold of. So they do get a hold of plastic bags and things like string, which cause obstructions. And the plastic bag can float on that liquid portion of the, um, the rumen content and then cover up the cardia or the opening so that the gas cannot escape. Other types of things like masses that actually push on the esophagus from the outside, so a tumour or an abscess, there might be some nerve damage which prevents the normal eructation or the belching process. Ruminal atony, which means that the rumen has stopped contracting. So this can happen um, secondarily, secondarily to other conditions such as grain poisoning um, and tetanus. And the last one is positional. So this is when a cow is down and then they go down on their side as in down to cows, or we saw this recently with um, the three day sickness cases that we were having, that we were encouraging people to prop up the cattle until they could recover, because once they go on their side, they will die of bloat. So the analogy I would use here is a balloon filled with water. So you can see in that yellow balloon, there's a very clear gas cap there. And if you imagine if you popped there, you would um, expel some gas. The other thing to look at is where that green um, balloon is tied up. If you imagine that's the esophagus, and then if you change the shape of the, or the direction of the balloon, that the liquid portion may go over that opening rather than the gas portion. Righto, so we're gonna talk about frothy bloat today. So that's primary bloat. Why does it happen? So essentially, just like a lot of problems with um, with nutrition and food for stock and things that cause sudden death, it's generally um, caused by eating too much, too quickly, and a food that your gut is not used to. So this not only happens in bloat, this happens with acidosis, um, pulpy kidney, it can happen with nitrate poisoning. Um, so the general rule is, you know, always to be introducing stock to different feed slowly. Um, so this is also what happens to us at Christmas. We eat too much, we eat it quickly because it's yummy and it's often very rich food that we're not used to. So digestion is how our body turns food we eat into nutrients that we use for energy growth and cell repair. So the problem occurs um, when things get out of balance. So basically it starts with the teeth, the chewing, the saliva, and then the microbes in the gut. And if this gets out of balance um, and, it's, and is upset, then the system doesn't time to, have time to adjust. So cows are designed to get the most out of a reasonably undigestible diet. And this is why they do well on, on hay and grass. Essentially, they've got nothing better to do than um, eat and to ruminate. So they've got plenty of time to get the most out of that feed. So digestion starts with the physical process of chewing, which breaks food into smaller pieces, increasing the surface area. The chewing stimulates the liver, which contains mainly water to moisten the food to allow for swallowing, but also electrolytes and components to help digest digestion. 
Saliva also contains bicarb, which is an acid buffer. So the bolus of food reaches the rumen through the esophagus and continues to be digested into the various nutrients. So the physical part of this is the rumen contractions, which help with the mixing of the food and the microbes and the fluids. And then we all um, have microbes in our gut. So the microbe population will change in response to the diet, but it does take time. So when food is consumed too quickly or in large volumes, the system becomes overwhelmed. So gas is a product of digestion. So when we have, when our stock eat highly digestible food, um, it decreases the physical work required to break it down. So digestion happens quickly. Um, consequently, the byproducts of digestion build up really quickly as well. So these are liquid, solids and gas. And in ruminants, this will be mostly methane gas. Gas is usually released from the rumen through the process of eructation or belching or burping um, after it forms that gas cap in the rumen. So failure to release the gas is what ends up um, causing bloat. So high, highly digestible feed um, are things like lush pasture with high water content. Um, so it doesn't require much chewing and it goes down quite easily. Things like grain um, and also processed feeds such as pellets that are low in fibre. So just a couple of interesting facts or um, useless information, depending on how you look at it. In healthy cattle, 30 to 50 litres of gas are produced every hour. And the gas travels up the esophagus at a rate of 160 to 225 centimetres per second. That's pretty quick. Now, just taking you back to the room and again, this um, great drawing you may have seen before, it's been done by Erica Kennedy, who was previously a district vet um, at Ningen. She's now a private vet at Ningen and Warren. Um, and this, this diagram was used a lot in the drought to help producers understand the function of the rumen and the requirements of the rumen just in an effort to help them understand why things go wrong essentially. Um, we we're getting lots of cases of grain poisoning and pulpy kidney. There was inadequate nutrition and then metabolic changes such as hypocalcemia. So this diagram shows how everything works together. So the feed comes in the esophagus and it's broken up um, into the various constituents that our body needs. Now, as you can see in Erica's diagram, you've got these little green bugs um, and they're the microbes that help break down our feed. So essentially we need to feed the bugs and feed the, feed the animal as well. Now, when we look at this system, depending on what's coming into the system depends on which bacteria will um, grow better. So one particular bacteria that produces a lot of methane gas and also loves feed with low fibre is Streptococcus bovis or Strep bovis. So just another look at the, the rumen bugs. They're made up of protozoa, fungi and bacteria. And the picture on the right, it's, I apologise for the quality, but that's roughly what it looks like when you look um, at rumen fluid under a microscope. So through the drought, in, an, in another effort to sort of help producers understand what was going on in the rumen, um, Jill Kelly, our DV over at um, Canamble, suggested that um, I take my microscope out into the paddock with me, which is what she'd been doing. And it was a really great tool. So if we did a postmortem on an animal, I could put some rumen fluid on the microscope and actually show the producers what it looks like in there. And what you'll see, um, and there's actually some great YouTube videos, is that these protozoa are whizzing around madly in a healthy rumen, but they're not there when the rumen's not healthy. There's literally billions of them. So when I think of the microbes in the rumen, I can't help but think of the Oompa Loompas um, in the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So they've all got their jobs, they're all working together and everyone has a purpose and, and then sometimes different circumstances will come at them, which they can adjust to. Um, but they need time. 
So bloat, clinical signs, what do we see? So for most of us in extensive grazing conditions, they will be found dead, unfortunately. So they'll be on their backs or sides with their legs out and very blown up abdomen. They may or may not have froth or blood from the nose, mouth, and maybe the back end. And you might see their eyes protruding. If they're found alive, so in, um, in dairies or containment situations or when stock are closely observed, you might see some intermittent swelling on the left side. Um, the cattle may stop grazing and be reluctant to move. Um, they're going to have a lot of trouble breathing, so they'll be panting, the tongue might be protruding, grunting, kicking at the abdomen and showing other signs of pain, such as vocalising and then staggering. The centre of the rim becomes so enlarged that it pushes on the diaphragm and this puts pressure on the lungs and the circulation. This prevents the blood from returning to the heart and other organs and the animal suffocates. Pretty awful. Now in this particular picture, which is um, from Bruce, Rott, the, Bruce Watt, sorry, the DV at Bathurst, um, you can see the dead animal on the grass, on the wheat there, but then you can see this animal at the back is already starting to bloat as well. So it's quite protruded out that left side. It's a great picture. So um, after they've died, you'll see the distended rumen, um, but this can also happen with a number of other conditions. Initially, the rumen will be filled with that stable foam, but that froth will subside over time. Generally there's congestion and hemorrhages um, in the head, neck and thorax and the back end of the animal will be, will be quite pale or blanched compared to the normal. You can sometimes see rib imprints on the surface of the lungs and they may or may not have a bloat line in the oesophagus. So these are some pics from Nick Cronin, DV at Forbes from last year. This is actually a case of feedlot bloat. And so you can see in the picture of that, um, that dead animal that the front half of its body are very, is very red and congested and the muscle in the back is very pale. And then Nick's put, um, got this great photo of a bloat line in the esophagus. So the dark end is the head end and the light end is the back end. Um, and that's where the most pressure has been placed. So these images and several others are from Flock and Herd, which I've just popped up the website there actually. It's a really great resource where vets put up their cases, but it's publicly available. So again, some images from Nick. Um, these, are sh these are sheep and you can see that red congestion in the head end um, and the paler looking muscles down the back end. And this is also a great shot of where those ribs are putting an imprint on the lungs in that shape. So treatment. So if you're lucky enough to get to your stock before there's any deaths or if there's maybe some deaths but some other are affected, um, the key is to move the stock from that paddock as soon as you can but very gently. Um, if there's severe cases you may have to try and restrain them in the paddock if there's no facilities to treat. So um, the initial treatment would be to dose them with anti-bloating agents through a stomach tube or a cannula. Obviously not everyone's going to have a stomach tube, but um, getting these anti-bloating agents into the room and, uh, the key, is the key. Um, the other, so the anti-bloat preparations will include wetters, which is an alcohol ethoxylate and different oils, which break down that foam and they may or may not actually kill the bacteria as well. So um, there's registered products such as Timpanol and Bloat Away, which always should be used as per label instructions. Um, but in an emergency when you don't have access to these, you can use paraffin oil um, or things like vegetable oils as well. Um, some people might get oral penicillin, which is given under veterinary prescription. In severe cases, um, and lots of people talk about being ready or having stabbed animals, and you can do it, um, but if you remember back to the beaten egg white um, analogy, you will see that putting a stab 
in the animal's rumen is not likely to release a lot of gas or give much relief because of that froth, which will just block the um, hole from the cannula or the stab incision. If you do do something like that, they're gonna need some antibiotics and some aftercare. So just a reminder again, this is a cow, this is another one of Nick Cronin's, but um, you can just see the sheer amount of rumen content that's coming out of that cow and how frothy and slimy it is. So the air is all trapped within that. And so giving them a stab is probably not gonna help, but if you get it in there and twist your knife and make a big enough hole, you might provide a little bit of relief, but enough to enough of a space to actually get some um, preventative or some treatment in there as well. So basically this photo, photo shows a, a trochar and cannula. These are just a plastic one that we always carried around with us when I was in private practice. They can be sutured in as well for chronic um, cases. We might need to top up the doses of, um, of treatment. And then the photo up on the top right there shows the position where you would make that incision. So it's about a hand's width back from the last rib and a hand's width down from the spine, which looks all well and good um, and quite defined in that pic, but obviously when the animal's bloated, it's a bit trickier. And then I've just popped a couple of photos of some um, commercial products in there. So prevention is probably going to be the best option in our um, situation in extensive grazing. So essentially avoidance of high risk pasture. So high risk pastures are those with 50% um, or more legume content. So post drought, we've seen a lot of um, clover, especially up in this part of the world so far, where we've had some rain and we've had some of that flood out country um, in the Warrego and the Paru. And also, um, due to the fact that some of the grass butts have been decimated in the terribly long drought that we've had and obviously the um, the season as well that um, leads to clover growth. So those high risk um, legumes are going to be lush and rapidly growing and then um, shorter than that sort of 25 to 30 centimetres in height in what we call the vegetative state. So this is before they setting um, flower. So other risks are high moisture con content of the soil. So again, in that flat out country or if we've had rain and then we have had some pretty dewy mornings as well, which just keeps that moisture there as well and helps those plants rapidly grow. The other thing about dew, um, there's a bit of a misconception about the dew making the plants more risky, but um, perhaps it could be just that the morning grazing is an issue as well because um, the soluble protein concentration in the plants, which is what breaks up and creates that slime, is generally highest in the morning. And um, yeah, so the other thing is that cattle eat a hell of a lot more in the morning as well. So they might just be getting, creating a risk by eating more. Um, as far as prevention, um, other methods, uh, to not induce, introduce hungry or empty stock to lush, lush feed. So you want to fill them up with hay to decrease the amount that they can eat um, and give access to roughage and also to ensure that their clostridial vaccinations are up to date and boosters are given. So um, with your cattle, that's going to be your five in one or your seven in one and with your sheep, the three in one through to that six in one. And I've just popped up that graph there that shows how you really need to um, give both, you know, you, your two initial shots if they haven't had any vaccinations before, and then um, which will give them a, a longer um, time of, um, you know, coverage, and then your annual booster. Just quickly, I'm just going to quickly. Like, flick back to that one because I had a producer ring me about um, a needle for bloat. So there is no needle for bloat. And I think um, what they may, what people might think is a needle for bloat is your vaccinations, but they're actually only preventing um, the clostridial diseases, plus the seven in one and six in one have some additions as well. But basically why we like you to have those up to date is because pulpy kidney or enterotoxemia can occur under similar conditions as bloat and can be um, sort of interchangeable or, or confused with bloat as well. Mm -hmm. 
So this is just some photos just from last week for, and up in the Cutterborough again near Yantabula and you can see that that, that um, is quite a monoculture there so it's a really high risk pasture. Um, it's getting up there in height but it's still pretty risky. It's um, I wouldn't think that's more than 30 centimetres high. Um, on the right you can just see there's some flowers starting to um, bud up there on the, that plant so that could um, be reducing the risk a little. So a low risk pasture is one that has a good variety of feeds, so legumes and grasses. So we like to see less than 50% legumes and a leaf to stem ratio of less than one to two. So basically what that's talking about is that those shorter pastures are gonna have more leaf and the leaf is where the chlorophyll is and the chlorophyll in the leaves is what's broken down to um, give those plant particles that trap the gases within the, within the rumen. Um, plants in bloom, they're less likely to cause bloat but can occur. A bloat can occur if the animals are hungry and are given access and they're not used to it. So um, just like with any change of feed, if you took some animals off um, a dry area and put them on a gisman or something, you want to introduce them slowly and make sure they're filled up with hay so they can't um, you know, really gorge themselves on that feed despite the fact that it might be over that height and setting flower. And then frosted and dried off pasture tends to be lower risk as well. Um, there are exceptions to the rule. So these um, cattle on the left there, you can see the one, the Hereford in the foreground there, but there's two in the background there as well. And if you saw that driving along, you probably wouldn't think that was a very bloaty looking pasture. But um, there is quite a bit of clover in there and it obviously varied across the paddock, but those three have died in it a pretty small area and I just came across those accidentally when I was going out on a sheep job in May. And then this photo that we saw before of Bruce Watts where um, these cattle are on grazing wheat. So other preventatives, um, we've mentioned the providing stock with how roughage and then the commercial preventatives um, would be your licks and your blocks. Now this might be another a time to have another little um, a poll in a minute. We'll just finish this slide. But basically, um, I'm just interested in how many people do just simply water from troughs because that gives another option for preventatives. But basically, you've got your bloat licks, which might have the um, the wetters in them, so the alcohol ethoxylate, and then things like your Weather Pro dry lick, which has manensin in it, which is a um, antibacterial and decreases that strep bovis. Um, just to push the point again, there is actually no vaccine or needle for bloat. So um, Tanisha, do you want to just run that poll now? Yep, just launching that poll now for everybody. So let me know if you can see that poll. So yep, collecting responses. What's the main water source for livestock on your property? So we've got tanks and troughs. So that means if you have access to troughing systems, if you only have access to groundwater, for example, rivers, creeks and ground tanks, and if it's not applicable, you are an advisor. Just wait for a couple of more votes. I can see that there's still some coming in. Remember that if you cannot answer the poll question, you may need to exit full screen mode in order to be able to answer the poll. All right, I'll give it another five seconds and I'll close that poll. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'll just share those results for you, Charlotte, there. So you can see we've got 57% with access to tanks and troughs, 14% with groundwater being the primary source of water and 29% advisors. Righto. Okay, so you can you hear me again now? No worries. Yep, okay, so yeah, so that gives another option. If you've just, if your um, stock are watering off troughs, it gives you another option for prevention. Um, so you can use some products that float on top of the water, and then obviously when they drink out of that, they will be getting um, dosed with the preventative, which is 
which is great. But obviously if we've got groundwater, we don't have access to that. Um, the thing about these lick blocks and the, the dry licks is they've obviously got to be accessing them, which um, is difficult with groundwater as well, because it's a bit hard to figure out where to place them. But also um, we know that stock tend to go for locks, uh, licks and um, blocks when they're lacking and when there's nice green feed, they're often not lacking in anything else. So that's, that's a bit tricky, but it's um, certainly worth trying and obviously you can monitor whether they're accessing it or not. Okay, another one that uh, preventative that we had, which was great for our kind of extensive grazing and particularly when there's groundwater was bloat capsules and they were made by Alenco and they had Menensin in them. Um, but unfortunately they were removed um, from the market in Australia in 2013 because the Menensin wasn't um, slowly coming out the way that it was supposed to. So sometimes um, it, the cattle were getting more menensin than, than they were supposed to, which leads to toxicity. And then sometimes they weren't getting enough. So then it wasn't um, preventing the bloat like it was supposed to. So I just actually found this um, article just this morning off Beef Central, Central talking about how they are on the market in New Zealand, but it is illegal to import them from, from New Zealand. So hopefully that's something they are working on it, but um, further down in the article, which you can find on that beefcentral.com, they did talk about how it, it's a bit of a way off for Australia, unfortunately. These were great too, because they did increase growth rates. So that meant you could get the stock off quicker, which again, helped you decrease the risk of exposure to bloat. And they were just a one dose, rather than um, some of the other preventatives that you have to dose regularly. Right, so just a quick recap on risk factors for frothy bloat. So we've got the plant factors, which are your high legume content um, and the variety. So in areas where there's improved pastures, research is looking into low bloat varieties that people might choose to grow. Um, the animal factors. So it seems to be that the individual animal susceptible susceptibility so, um, is more of a thing than the breed, age and sex. So um, if you're in a situation where you're monitoring stock really regularly, which probably most of us aren't, but so in dairies and you know small small paddocks, um, the ones that are getting this chronic sort of subclinical bloat wouldn't be the ones that you breed from. But as far as um, you know, types, I think you know, Boss Indicus people, you know, you hear that they're a bit more susceptible purely because of the size of their rumen. But I could not find anything that was convincing on. Um, on breed, age and sex. There was one article, the one from Ethiopia actually, where they did a bit of um, work and decided that young males were more prone to bloat, to frothy bloat than older animals and females, but the difference was um, not much different. And really the, um, the difficulty in researching such a thing is pretty hard, like there's so many variables and you know, measuring volume of rumens and that type of thing is, is um, obviously pretty tricky. So. Nothing convincing in the literature at the moment. Um, other animal factors are saliva content. So again, that's something that researchers looked at. And um, you know, there are various proteins, some animals that have had various proteins measured um, at a greater, greater level in their saliva have shown to be less um, susceptible to bloat. But also, yeah, rumen size, the shape of the rumen, you know, where the esophagus is or the cardia in relation to the rest of the room and that type of thing um, has been looked at as well. Pretty much nothing to hang your hat on at the moment. I wouldn't um, go for one breed over another just in the hope to prevent bloat if your pasture is a big risk. So we've got our environmental factors. We've spoken about the moisture, so irrigation, um, you know, lush growing feed. Um, is always going to be a risk. Um, moist food's really easily digested. And the other thing is um, in cold weather, stock will eat more because they'll require more energy just to keep warm. And then management. So on improved pastures, we're looking at things like fertiliser and the pasture mix, um, but just in general introduction of stock um, as far as introducing stock that um, have been fed with some filled up with some hay so that they're not gorging themselves on this feed um, and maybe choosing not to introduce stock while the pasture is risky obviously as well. So a few more issues I feel a bit glass half empty but um, glass half full is that this 
these photos are all from last week in our region and obviously we've had some pretty widespread rain in the region over the weekend, which is great. So, um, so this photo on the left, you can really see that bright green, which is the clover on the Cutterborough and then that dry sort of the ligament popping out and then you've got all that sort of um, delta looking catchment area there as well. So the issue there is that as this dries up, you get that freshening up um, on the edges of the water. So, um, and then if you get some rain events as well, that freshens that up. So even, so it's not like in these situations, you can wait till that paddock is safe and then introduce the stock because there seems to be always some risky, risky growth coming back behind it. Um, yeah, and then there's another photo on the right as well. You can sort of see that that bright green as well. So it's a bit um, closer up. Oh, the other thing is, um, we've spoken about the ground water, but obviously in these massive paddocks, if you had some effect, it'd be, it might be a bit hard to actually treat them individually. Um, the other thing is, I've spoken about that stock are unlikely to access the lick blocks or dry licks when there's such nice green feed available. Um, and even like in the in the picture on the right, you can see that there is a bit of roughage in the paddock, but they're probably going to go for the lush stuff. Um, the one on the right actually is um, all part of those series of photos of up at the Cutterborough last week. And you can see that there's a bit of grass coming through as well. So hopefully that will decrease the risk if they choose to graze um, a bit of both. Righto, so what else could it be? So what are other causes of sudden death um, that we see? So certainly anthrax um, is always in the forefront of our minds out here in the Western Division. So, um, sorry, that map's a bit dodgy with the, because I've blown it up, but you can get the gist of where that anthrax belt's running down the middle there of New South Wales. And certainly this um, poor ram on the left there was just at Ivanhoe last year. And you can see there that they die, they, um, with that sort of red froth, bloody froth coming out their nose, which you can see in cases of bloat as well. Um, anthrax affects cattle and sheep quite equally. Um, other causes of sudden death, we had a real doing with nitrate poisoning um, just after the we, some of the areas got a bit of a break. Um, and that's to do with the nitrogen that's sort of been sitting in the ground with no feed, um, really being sucked up by the plants as they're growing and then um, hungry stock being introduced um, and ending up with nitrate poisoning. The other one's oxalate poisoning. So that also can depend on the type of feed that they're eating, things like pigweed, um, tribulus or cathead, um, ends up causing hypocalcemia, um, pulpy kidney or other clostridial diseases. So all of these um, cases of sudden death can will look quite bloated after they've um, after they've died and particularly those clostridial diseases such as anthrax and pulp kidney um, the carcass will blow up quite a bit so it's a bit hard to tell the difference if you don't see them actually dying and um, you've really got to look, look at the the other conditions surrounding the deaths which might be um, actually similar to what you might see in bloat Um, just actually, just quickly, I've just got a note here back to that pulpy kidney issue. So pulpy kidney is actually enterotoxemia or overeating disease. And we always sort of suggest that your vac vaccinations are up to date in general, but particularly with bloat prone pastures because pulpy kidney can occur on similar pastures, but it's actually um, not happening in the room and it's happening further along in the intestines because they're Basically the rumen can't digest it enough, the food, and it goes into the intestines and then you get this proliferation of this um, clostridial bacteria and then production of a toxin, which um, ends up killing the animal. Another thing I just wanted to mention was red gut and sheep. Um, so sheep will suffer from just straight out bloat like we saw in some of the other photos, but this one's red gut and look, you're mainly going to see this on loosened pastures and often um, mainly in, in younger sheep. I think this was just a six month old sheep actually down on the tablelands. But what happens is the intestines actually twist and you get that torsion and that horrible um, hemorrhagic sort of mess there that you can see in this poor sheep. But a few years or quite a few years ago now, um, the 
vet that I used to job share with here, Kylie Greentree, she diagnosed red gut in um, some young Dorpa rams that were actually being confinement fed on loose and hay. So, um, yeah, that was interesting as well. So as far as um, ringing the vet or trying to figure out what's going on, sometimes I get these, you know, people telling me that they've had all these deaths and I'll say, why didn't you ring me? And um, a lovely fellow years ago said to me up in the Cutterborough, well, pretty much Charlotte, we're, we're smelling them before we're seeing them, which is true in that, in that lignum and in those big paddocks. But um, there are things that we can do um, up to, uh, almost up to a week pretty much to rule out anthrax, which is what we always wanna do um, in this area. Initially, a fresh, like preferably a fresh animal is great for a post-mortem. We can get a lot of information from post-mortem. And when I say fresh, I mean in that same day um, is best. So as soon as you find it to ring the vet. Um, so things like this ICT kit, which we can get an answer whether or not it's anthrax or not while we're standing next to the animals, really fantastic. And then we can go on and do a post-mortem if we've ruled out anthrax. That one's actually a positive one. It was from that ram that we saw. But then um, as long as we can get some eye fluid, so often um, we can get eye fluid out of the downside eye, we can rule out things like nitrate poisoning um, and acidosis um, and hypocalcemia actually as well. There's quite a bit of information we can get from the eye fluid. And then in older carcasses, we can still rule out anthrax um, using a piece of ear. So we send that ear off to the lab and there's a different test that they can do that's quite sensitive um, to rule out anthrax. So just always call the vet um, and that might prevent some further deaths. But importantly, things like anthrax are zoonotic, so they can affect humans. So we don't want to um, run into that situation. Okay, so that wraps up the bloat part of the webinar, but um, Tanisha did ask me just to talk about some other issues to look out for. So I'll just quickly touch on a couple. So as I've mentioned, we've had some nice rain over the weekend and the weather will start to warm up soon, which means that situation will become ideal for worms, so intestinal worms. So either um, scour worms or barber's pole worms. So the message is in Western New South Wales is to don't reach for the ranch, but do a worm test first. So these worm test kits are available from all the local land services offices and we can um, post them out to you. And they're free, so you can just have them sitting in your cupboard until you think you need them. And then once you send them off and fill out the form, they will the lab will in, in, um, invoice you. So I think the cheapest one is about $36 and then you can go right up to the, the gold test with um, typing, which works out to be about $80 which is pretty cheap compared to buying sheep drench. And, um, you know, we don't really encourage drenching out here unless we really need to. And then the results will come through to the vet, either Trent or myself, and then we will normally give you a call and go over the results and help you interpret them. But basically, um, these little larvae, so you've got your sheep and that sheds the eggs and then that, that goes through a couple of stages of larvae, but they're very resilient. So even though I know we've had quite a lot of drought years and dry, um, they can survive um, in little refuges in your paddocks. And then once the weather warms up and we've got the moisture and grass, they go through the stages to the infective stage and crawl up the grass and infect your sheep. So scour worms usually get a few clues first. You might see some scouring or a bit of weight loss. Um, Barber's pole worm, they can lay a hell of a lot of eggs in a day. So things move pretty quickly there. So with the worm test, you just need to, you don't have to have the sheep in. So usually I recommend that you do it leading up to having the, the stock in for shearing or crutching or something like that. And you just go out into the paddock where they're camped up and um, disturb them and they'll usually drop some fresh dung and you can collect 10 bottles worth of poo and send it straight off in the mail, back in the prepaid bag. So that's something to look out for. And the other one is just a reminder to get your clostridial vaccinations up to date. Um, with the sheep, yeah, there are a couple of options. Your five in one, which is just your five clostridial diseases. So your tetanus, pulpy kidney, black leg, black disease, and malignant edema. But you do have the option for a little bit of extra money um, to get the six in one, which will cover you for the cheesy gland as well. So um, we've looked at 
our abattoir data from Western New South Wales. Every year we get a report and the cheesy gland is one of the largest reasons for trim at the abattoir. You can have a look in this um, photo of this sheep lung. This was actually recently, pretty recently near Burke. And you can see that big cheesy gland abscess sitting in the lungs. And those lungs were a mess actually. Um, they were really stuck to the rib cage and um, yeah, it's obviously not helping growth rates and the general health of that animal. And then, um, so these are just some rough prices that I was given recently just by one of the agents. There's obviously different brands um, and different size packs, which will change the pricing. But just to give you an idea of the cost difference between using a five in one and a six in one. And then with your cattle, there's the five in one or the seven in one will do your lepto as well. Um, so I think that is it from me. So that's um, my numbers on the slide there. Trent McCarthy's our vet down at Baronga. He's on leave for a few weeks, but his number is there. Um, if you're not in Western, or even if you are, you can access the website and look up um, all the vets to contact or biosecurity officers. And if in doubt, if ever in doubt, just ring this disease watch hotline, which you can plug in into your phone. And that is it from me. Thanks, Tanisha. Great, thank you, Charlotte. That was a, a really great summary of the risks, treatment options and prevention methods of bloat in our region. I'll just change the screen back to my screen and then we'll go through some questions. So just a reminder to the audience that if you have any questions, please type them in the questions box. While we're waiting, I do have a couple of questions for you, Charlotte. Okay. Um, the first one is, how can I avoid bloat in bottle fed lambs if this is a risk? Ah, oh, okay. I was going to touch on that. So yeah, we do see the bloat in the bottle bottle fed um, lambs and that is actually not in their rumen. That's, um, so basically when the lambs are born, there's a um, process that happens when they're sucking from their mothers. That means that the um, the milk bypasses the rumen until the rumen gets a chance to develop and the rumen will start to develop when the sheep or the lambs are eating more grass or solid feed. Um, so what happens with potties is that they basically gorge themselves and waggle their tails and drink a lot of milk and um, the cyst, that sort of reflex can be disrupted a little bit but basically they get it they get too much into their ab abomasum, which is that poor stomach. And then the bloating process happens because of bacteria and different things there as well. So yeah, it's basically, the idea is to not give them as much in one go is essentially um, what it comes down to. I know that's hard, but working out how much they need per day and dividing it up. So initially giving them more feeds per day as they get bigger and stronger and their um, their stomachs develop properly. I can dig Great, up some more you. information if someone, if that person wants to, yeah, if, email me, yep. Yep, no worries. Uh, the next question that we do have is, is the trough treatment safe for other stock? Yeah, so basically for sheep, like if you had cattle and sheep in a paddock, that would be fine. Mm, I don't know about the, if you had a horses in there, I probably wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be putting the horses in to the paddock that you had that trough in with the treatment. So basically the treatments are going to be the oily type. So they float on the water and um, yeah, you might have some with those wetting agents as well to decrease the froth. So um, they're not going to be registered for horses but for ruminants, um, I'm sure they're going to be fine. But basically there'll be commercial treatment. So they'll have the um, all the information on the side and you need to use them only in the animals that they're registered in. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question, reminder, if anyone's got any last questions just to type them in. But while we're waiting, there has been a question, Charlotte, why does the dead animal go red at the head end again. Can you just recap briefly that? Oh, yep, for sure. And I'll just see if I can find, 
oh, I don't know if I can go back to it, but basically, um, so when the rumen gets enlarged with the gas, it puts extreme pressure on the diaphragm and that really places pressure on the lungs and all the organs around there. So it essentially, um, it can happen very quickly, the bloating, um, the bloat in really acute cases. So it stops that blood, all that pressure, stops the blood um, returning back to the rest of the animal. So it all sort of gets trapped up in that head end of the animal. So then there is, um, yeah, and then you get that really distinct bloat line. Thank you. That's It's really interesting. There's quite a bit to bloat is quite a complex issue that is often overlooked, I believe. Yeah, that, it actually that's is. All the, so, um, we... all the questions, yep. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, it is actually Sorry. complex. So um, for us out here, it gets a little less complex um, in that the preventative options aren't as great, but um, yeah, there is there there has been pressure on Meat and Livestock Australia to put more um, money into researching bloat. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Definitely, thank you very much, Charlotte, for your time this afternoon, and thank no you all for attending today's webinar. I'll just ask that if everyone could please take the time to complete the post webinar survey. It's a great way for you to provide feedback to us and guide any future events that we might like to run and webinars you may like to see. If you have any questions, please feel free, as Charlotte said, to contact Charlotte or myself and you will receive a follow up email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this webinar and that will have my details on it as well. Thank you everyone for attending.